Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisance to Sogla Shashir Prabhupada. Welcome to Devotees to today's morning class. Today we will be discussing from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 2, Verses 19. And the chapter is entitled, The Lord in the Heart. It's been a very interesting, uh, really deepening meditative chapter in the sense that it's getting us into the core of our Krishna consciousness, helping us to get to the core of our heart to connect with the Lord even more. And we're very happy to have His Holiness Chandra Mali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. And it's all yours, Maharaj. My obeisances to everyone. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Itam munas tu pamared bhavastito. Vigyana drig virya sura dita sayaham. Svaparsna pars, nadipi ya. Gudam tato nilam stane shusat suna mayaj jitat klamaha. <laughs> Translation By the strength of the scientific knowledge, one should be well situated in absolute realization and thus be able to extinguish all material desires. One should then give up the material body by blocking the air hole through which stool is evacuated with the heel of one's foot and by lifting the life air from one place to another in the six primary places. Hmm. Purport. There are many duratmas who claim to have realized themselves as Brahman and yet are, are unable to conquer material desires. In the Bhagavad Gita 1854, it's clearly mentioned that the absolutely self-realized soul becomes completely aloof from all material desires. Material desires are based on the false ego of the living being and are extinguished by his childish and useless activities, or I'm sorry, are extinct, exhibited by his childish and useless activities to conquer the laws of material nature and by his desire to lord it over the resources of five elements. With such a mentality, one is led to believe in the strength of material science. With the discovery of atomic energy and space travel by mechanical vehicles, and by such tiny advancements in material science, the false egotist tries to challenge even the strength of the Supreme Lord, who can finish all of man's tiny endeavors in less than a second. The well-situated self, or Brahman, realized soul, perfectly understands that the Supreme Brahm, Brahman, or the personality of Godhead, is the all-powerful Vasudev, and that he, the self-realized living being, is part and parcel of the Supreme Whole. As such, his constitutional position is to cooperate with him in all respects in the transcendental relationship of the served and the servitor. Such a self-realized soul ceases to exhibit his useless activities of attempting to lord it over material nature. By scientifically well-informed, being scientifically well-informed, he fully engages himself in faithful devotion to the Lord. <laughs> the expert yogi, who has thoroughly practiced the control of life here by the prescribed method of the yoga system, is advised to quit the body as follows. He should plug up the evacuating hole with the heel of the foot and then progressively move the life air on and on to six places, the navel, the abdomen, the heart, the chest, palate, eyebrows, and cerebral pit. Controlling the life air by this prescribed yoga process is mechanical, and by the practice, and the practice is more or less a physical endeavor for spiritual perfection. In olden days, such practice was very common for the transcendentalists. 
where the mode of life and character in those days were favorable. But in modern days, where the influence of Kali Yuga is so disturbing, practically everyone is untrained in this art of bodily exercise. Concentration of the mind is more easily attained in these days by the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. Results are more effective than those derived from the inner exercise of the life air. Om Gyan Tividanda Syagyana Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tas Mai Shri Gurudevena Maha Shri Chaitanya Minobistam Stapitam Yaina Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kidam Mayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kamb Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhaktarindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Namam Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta, Swamini Tinamine. Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine, Nirvasesa, Sunyavari Vasyatya De Satarine. In the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which is entitled Dhyana Yoga, or meditation in practice through the various types of yoga systems, one can practice self-realization. Krishna mentions the Astanga Yoga system, Yama, Niyama, Asanam, Pranayam, Pratyahara, Dhyana, 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 um, let's see, Dhyana, and Dharna, Dharna, Dhyana, and ultimately Samadhi. He explains it, but he also rejects it after, and in this age, it's not possible. As it says here, people were qualified, and the atmosphere was favorable to perform the yoga system. And it was a mechanical system, raising the life air from the lower part of the chakra, the lowest chakra, to all the way up to the highest chakra. And then at the favorable time, release that energy throughout the cerebral part of the body, the head. And then that energy carrying the soul goes to wherever the yogi wants to direct it. <clears throat> we see the example of uh, Bhishma Dev. Bhishma Dev, he had the power to leave his body whenever he wanted. And even though he was laying on the battlefield full of arrows shot by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his body was like a pincushion the arrows were so profuse that they kept his body off the ground and were going into the earth. But he knew the process of the yoga system and he also knew that he had the power and benediction that he could die only when he wanted. Of course, he took that time to enlighten Yudhisthir in how to rule the kingdom because Bhishma Dev was the qualified ruler actually, but because he... he remained brahmachari his whole life, he couldn't take the position of king. And so ultimately, of course, there was a, the whole battle of Kurashrecha was who was going to take the throne. Was it the Pandavas or the Kurus? Both were followers of uh, <clears throat> the same family, members of the same family. But the Pandavas were favored by Krishna, where the Kurus were not, because the Kurus tried to surreptitiously take the kingdom because they said this was Dhritarashtra. He had said that, well, actually, I meant to be king because my brother Pandu was no longer there and I'm the next in line. And But because I am blind, I cannot take that position. So my sons should have the kingdom. But the sons of Pandu were actually the righteous uh, heirs to the kingdom. And that was the five brothers headed by Yudhisthira Maharaj. 
because they were sons of Pandu and therefore they had the right. But uh, uh, what's it? Yeah, Dhritarashtra was greedy. He wanted his sons to rule, and that was the reason for the Battle of Kurukshetra. Of course, Krishna favored the Pandavas because the Pandavas were righteous. And headed by the Kurus, Duryodhana was avaricious and somewhat against religious principles. That was the whole battle of Kurukshetra. And, uh, and so Bhishmadev, in the last part, he favored the Pandavas, although he fought on the side of the Kurus. And that's a long story why he did that, because... He did that to show that anyone who's against Krishna, no matter how powerful they were, they will be defeated. That was a message he sent to the world. Because Bhishma Dev was so powerful that he could annihilate the entire Kuru, uh, Pandava army simply by his own self. He didn't need any other self. He was such a powerful warrior. And at the same time, he had the benediction. He could not die only when he wanted so it seems like the Kurus were favored, but uh, Bhishma was a devotee of Lord Krishna, therefore he favored the Pandavas, and therefore he didn't fight to his capacity. And of course, at the end, he did fight in order to bring Krishna into the battle where he could exchange loving relationships with Krishna by fighting with Krishna because he's in the mood of chivalry. So he was fighting with Krishna, but it was a, a fight of love based on exchanging arrows. And those arrows that hit the body of Bhishma Dev were like love bites that were given by the lover to the beloved. <laughs> and that's how he accepted it, of course. And then, of course, now he's on the battlefield and he waited. <clears throat> Till the sun went into the northern meridian before he actually left the world. He chose when he decided to leave. Yeah. And so this is the example here that the yogis are so powerful. Bhishma Dev was also a pure yogi. He could leave the world whenever he wanted to and direct his attention towards wherever destination he wanted. Of course, he actually worshipped the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so he took full shelter of Krishna in the loving exchange of chivalry. And ultimately, he attained the perfectional stage of Vaikuntha. He actually entered into the Vaikuntha realm. So here we see, although this whole chapter talks about this method of self-realization, Srila Prabhupada ends the purport saying that in this age it's not favorable. And Krishna also mentions that in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. In the age of Kali, no one can practice this yoga system. It's too difficult. The atmosphere is not favorable. People cannot go to the Himalayas, sit in meditation facing the north, wearing a deer skin, and practice all of these austerities in order to raise the, the, the life energies all the way up and out through the top of the head. There are yogis who still try to do that today, and some of them are successful, but they live a life completely aloof from all other living entities. They live in caves in the Himalayas and practice this yoga system. Sometimes they come out to the Kumbha Mela and you see them. Some of them are 150, 200. 200, almost up to 300 years old. And they can keep, they can maintain their life for many, many years simply by balancing the airs within the body. If you know the, if you know the art, you can extend your life for hundreds of years simply by manipulating the airs into the body. It's a great art. It's the yogis, the perfect yogis, they know these this art. But who can practice this, this art in this age? It's, it's practically impossible. Therefore, Prabhupada ends the purport saying that the easiest and most direct method is the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Now, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra has been ordained as the means for self-realization by the Supreme Lord himself 
who incarnated in, in himself as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to teach this art of self-realization and also demonstrate the art in his own practice in the mood of his own devotee. That's Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we follow this simple process of chanting Hare Krishna. But it's not so easy to chant Hare Krishna. When we always, when we discuss chanting a Hare Krishna, we always talk about how the mind wanders. And in order to get the benefit of chanting Hare Krishna, you have to keep that mind focused on the sound vibration without it wandering here and there. And therefore, there's a lifestyle that is supportive of the chanting of the Hare Krishna, and that is the process of pure devotional service. So when we follow the process given by the spiritual teachers and live very strictly according to that, we can purify our activities in this material world and then actually become qualified to chant the holy names of the Lord with full attention and devotion. So although the process is easy, you simply chant and hear, but how many of us can actually keep that mind focused on the sound vibration throughout our 16 rounds and beyond? Yeah. It's not so easy. Therefore, it requires a one take seriously to the practice of Krishna consciousness. Although the, the chanting of the Hare Krishna is the means for self-realization, the process is supportive of the means of re self-realization. Therefore, Prabhupada says, those who simply chant and don't follow the process, they will be they will not be able to perfect their chanting because the process is supportive. Hearing and reading Srimad Bhagavatam, association and serving other Vaishnavas, worship the Lord in his deity form, taking only food offered to the Lord Krishna Prashadam. All of these are requirements in order to purify our consciousness. So when we actually sit down to chant, we can actually absorb ourselves in the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So the whole process is a package and not simply the holy name by itself. As one becomes proficient and the process of chanting, and one develops their chanting, then the process becomes simply chanting more and more. So the great souls, many of them don't follow all of the other processes because they have actually perfected their level of chanting Hare Krishna and they're on the level of Sudhanam. We have to go through the different stages of chanting. The beginning stage is Namaparad. We recite the 10 offenses to the holy name each day in the temple during the morning program. One should hear these offenses understand what they mean and on, and very carefully avoid those offenses. As we get rid of the offenses, we come to the next stage, which is called Namabas. It's called a glimmer of the holy name. It's compared to the, the sunrise when it rises in the morning, but it is not over the horizon yet. Although the sun is not seen, the light of the sun is seen even before the sun comes up. So this is called the Namabas stage. It's like the light of the holy name is starting to manifest, but it has not fully developed to the stage of perfection yet. And that is called Nama, Nama, Namabas. <laughs> and then when that stage becomes full or developed, then we come to the stage of pure chanting, which is called Sudanam. And that is actually chanting the holy names. And you can learn about the whole process of Sudanam from Srila Haridas Thakur, as explained by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur in his treatise Harinam Chintamani. That book is very much recommended for those of you who want to perfect the process of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It's a very detailed and very nice explanation. The text is by Srila Haridas Thakur and the purports and explanations are taken by the pure devotee Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. <laughs> so that is the process in this age, is to protect, perfect our Krishna consciousness through chanting and serving in devotion according to the guidance and instructions given by Krishna 
in the scriptures and explained to the aspiring disciples by the bona fide spiritual master. Now that is the process. And if we practice this chanting more and more and more, Prabhupada said 16 rounds is just really a minimum to get you involved in a regular system of chanting. And as chanting develops, then one chants more and more and more. And one even looks forward to chanting more and more and more. So Prabhupada would say, when you're actually chanting, you'll think 16 rounds, why not 16,000 rounds? So the taste of the holy name is so sweet and so direct that it connects us with Krishna perfectly. And then that taste of that association with Krishna just enthralls the devotee in happiness and they want to chant more and more and more. And it becomes a feature of not just uh, worship, but it becomes a feature of, of one's whole life's activity. So it's a process. But here we're seeing the other process, how it's explained and Krishna mentions also in the 12th chapter, verse number five in the Bhagavad Gita, he says this, one can also become perfect by this system, but it's very difficult. And the process is so precise that if there's a little error in the execution of the yoga system, then that error will cause one to completely fail. But in bhakti, even though one hasn't attained to the perfectional stage, they can still practice the process and gradually become more and more proficient in the process until they come to the stage of executing devotional service exactly according to Guru, Shado, and Shastra. So chant more, chant always, practice chanting. Whenever you have time, uh, just pick up your beads or even without chanting on the beads, just chant the holy name always. The, the scriptures say, Satatam Kirtayan Tomam, one should glorify Krishna 24 hours a day. And that is the process for self-realization, which takes one's consciousness into the realm of spiritual existence. In other words, one associating with Krishna directly through his holy name. Okay, we can stop here. <laughs> Thank you, Marge, for such a powerful class about the holy name, really. Um, lots of good points, a lot of good points. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing, <clears throat> and I request devotees, if you can turn on your camera wherever you're at, if possible. And um trying to get this thing out of me so I can get the right list here. And would ask devotees if you have any questions. Anything that you would like to ask, clarify, please do raise your hand and uh, I will call upon you or you can put it in the chat and I'll be happy to, you know, read your question to you, uh, to you for you. Marge, I have a question while others are thinking, Marge. So Marge, is Namaba stage also another word for it is mechanical chanting? Is that the early stages? No, it's not mechanical. It's, it's offenseless chanting. That's the other... It's another name for it, is offenseless chanting. <laughs> Namaparad is still chanting with offense, and there's very little taste in that chanting. Therefore, one has to practice the chanting along with removing the effects of the 10 offenses to the holy name, including the 11th offense, which is inattention. So as one progresses and finishes these 10 offenses, no longer affected by it, then they're in the offenseless stage of chanting, but it's still not pure chanting yet. And it's a transition stage to pure chanting. Like that. I use the example of the, the sun. Although the, the light of the sun is seen, the sun is not seen. It's like... You're getting a glimmer of the. You can uh, you can use another analogy. Sometimes you see clouds in the sky, and then you see a break in the cloud, and a sun ray comes through that break. That's also used as an analogy for namabas. 
that stage the devotee is happy they're tasting something in the chanting of the holy name but it's not it's not has hasn't reached perfection yet so march what is the stage before namabas yeah, you know, offense, offensive chanting. Not namaparat. Okay. Well, as long as we're still chanting when offenses, there's very little taste. That's why we lose our attraction for chanting after some time because we're still chanting with offenses, and we think, "Boy, I'm not getting any taste," and so we get less enthusiastic to chant, and sometimes we give it up because there's no taste. But we have to keep working and very carefully. Uh, know the offenses and uh, what we say, carefully avoid the offenses. Bhakti Vinoda Kaur says, if you practice attentive chanting, the tendency to commit the other 10 offenses becomes less and less. But these other 10 offenses, well, there are they're blocks in our relationship with our chanting of the holy name. The first offense is the blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to the propagation of the holy name of the Lord. The second offense is to consider demigods like Lord Brahma or Lord Shiva to be on, to equal to or uh, uh, superior to Lord Vishnu. Third offense is to disobey the orders of the spiritual master or to think that the spiritual master is an ordinary person. The fourth offense is to consider the, uh, to what is it, to blaspheme other scriptures uh, that are in pursuance of the Vedic version, although they might be not pure scriptures. If we uh, criticize them or blaspheme them, that's also an offense, because these scriptures are meant for other people to raise them up to the stage of the mode of goodness where they can actually practice devotional service. The fifth offense is to, what is the fifth offense? Is to um, consider um, the chanting as imagination. To consider the chanting Hare Krishna as some imagination. Uh, well, you know, it's just, yeah, the scriptures are just saying that it's really just imagination just to get you to, just to get you to chant. It's not really like that. The sixth offense is to give some interpretation of the holy name, to compare the holy name to something material in this world and say, well, it's the holy name is like a nice, fresh, clean bath in the morning where one becomes enlivened by a nice bath, <laughs> something like that, or to compare it to, to any other form of spiritual practice. The seventh is to commit sinful activities on the strength of the holy name, to uh, commit a sinful activity and think I can chant and get to fr get free from those sinful activities simply by the process of chanting. That is also an offense. The eighth offense is to consider, uh, what is it? Ritualistic. The chanting of the, yes, Maharaj. Uh, ritualistic activities that are mentioned in the Vedas as, you know, equal, in other words, I do my homa, I do my puja, I do my worship, you do your chanting, it's all the same. It's not. The holy name is above all of these other ritualistic activities. And to consider other forms of worship on the same level of, as chanting is another offense. Ninth offense is to, to um, teach the glories of the chanting to the faithless persons. Those who are not interested, we try to force or try to Glorify the holy name by speaking about Krishna's pastimes in the in Vrindavan to people who are not qualified to hear or don't even don't even want to hear. And the tenth offense, this is the one the devotees have to be careful with. After understanding so many instructions on the glories of chanting the holy name and the benefits that come by chanting, still one is attached to material life. <laughs> Still one is trying to fulfill their desires for material happiness and still at the same time chant the holy name. And then the 11th offense is to, to chant inattentively. Mm -hmm. So these, um, know these 11 offenses, 10th offense plus the, 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 the additional one, and carefully avoid them. Mm -hmm. And chant it. <laughs> 
at the same time. Marge, I I remember in the old days, and I and I keep saying old days, but I, I think it's really important that you know because nowadays, at, at least in many temples, that is not recited, and many devotees really don't remember or really read those ten offenses and memorize them or know them. It's so important that I think it, at least it has to be put on the refrigerator. So we see it on the wall of our room door or something. So we see it every single day. My experience in, in my travels is every temple I go to, they recite it. I haven't seen any temple that hasn't recited, but but that does but I haven't visited all of the temples, so I don't really know. So. But most temples do recite it. Right after Tulsi Arti, and then they recite the ten offenses. Thank you, Marge. Yes, Nitya Gopal, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Maharaj Dandut Pranam, Jaisilu Prabhupada. Thank you so much for enlightening in such a wonderful class, and specifically the three stages of chanting. I was just wondering, Maharaj, how do you know Lord is pleased with our chanting? Ask him. <laughs> My dear Lord, Please let me allow me to chant in such a way that it'll be it'll be very pleasing to you. <laughs> you can pray like that. And if you're very perceptive, you can understand whether Krishna's pleased or not by your own experience. <laughs> your experience should also tell you whether Krishna's pleased or not. If Thank no, you. If there's no taste in your chanting, then obviously you're still chanting with offense. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Nice question, Nita Gopal. Thank, Thank you. you. What can we say? I mean, it's an experience. Chanting is an experience. And you can uh, you can evaluate simply by your experience. You may not always understand completely, but if you're enthusiastic to chant, that is an indication that you're chanting nicely. If you lose your enthusiasm and become mechanical in your chanting just to finish your rounds, then obviously you're not actually approaching the holy name properly. Thank you so much, Max. Sri Devi, it's all yours. Thank you, Anasya. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance in your glories to Srila Prabhupada. Mm. Guru Maharaj, you said a very important thing when you said if you only chant but do not follow the process correctly, then you cannot succeed in chanting. So this process which is supportive, does that mean Waking up early in the morning, going for Mangalarati, chanting the Gurvashtakam prayers, etc. And then really purifying the mind and uh, intentionally focusing the mind on chanting. Then we can chant properly. And if we do not do those things, if we skip those things, then our chanting becomes very distracted. At least this is my experience. Very distracted and then it goes on to inattentive and unfocused and so on and so on. So for us, our supportive lifestyle means following the morning program, right? Yeah. If you can't have, if you can't go to the temple, at least do a morning program in your home. Mm. Or some semblance of a morning program. So, even if you're alone, you can, you know, you can... Pick up a pair of cartels and sing the the, the Guru Vastakam prayers in the morning. Or you can hear Srila Prabhupada chant Mangalarti. You can read the books. You can have a little altar in your home and do some puja to the deities. 
You can read Bhagavatam. You can take only Krishna Prashadam. If you're not able to go to the temple for whatever reason, you should find some spiritual foundation which sets the day for the entire activity of Krishna consciousness. And these things will support your chanting. As Srila Prabhupada said, he uses an analogy. He said, if you're simply chanting and you're not following the process, he says you're cooking with smoke. <laughs> That's Prabhupada's statement. So if you try to, he said, if you try to cook with smoke, your breakfast will take three, 300 years <laughs> to cook. <laughs> so in other words, all of these other activities, that's why they're all part of the same process. But as I mentioned, as you progress in your devotional service, chanting becomes more foremost in your practice. Mm -hmm. Or you might find devotees will emphasize a particular aspect, such as reading and preaching Srimad Bhagavatam, or worshiping the deity, like that. They'll continue to chant, but they're also emphasize a certain aspect of devotional service because it becomes their attraction in Krishna consciousness. But the holy name is the essence. <laughs> I understand, Guru Maharaj, that early morning chanting is the best chanting. But what if we want to chant extra and then, you know, the day has begun, there are things to be done, etc., how can we maintain the same quality of rounds for our second set of chanting? Well, you have to be in the right mood, a right mindset in order to develop that. You pick a time of the day where you see that that will be the favorable time where you can chant nicely. Just like I would suggest before you take prasadam, is a good time to chant, but after you take prasadam, it becomes more difficult to chant. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Nice question, Sri Devi. Thank you. Yes, Radha Vilasani, please. Sorry, Rasa Vilasani Radha. I apologize. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Tamil Pranam. Uh, please accept my humble obeisance on to Lotus Feast. Maharaj, uh, sometimes it is very difficult to chanting or uh, to focus on chanting and to avoid Nam Aparad at the same time. So how to understand this, Maharaj? Mm -hmm. Well, how to... You know what the offenses are and you try to avoid them. But if you don't know what they are or you don't know how to avoid them, then you're, you're still chanting Nam Aparad. So if I tell you, you know, if you go in this direction, you won't get to where you're going. But if you go in this direction, you'll go, you'll get to where you're going. So you avoid that direction. That is the wrong way. So similarly, we should know what these, these, uh, and, but avoid them. That's all. Just don't commit these offenses. Understand what they are. For instance, the tenth offense, we we hear so much instructions from the spiritual teachers, from Krishna through Shastra, and in general about giving up material desires as a way to progress in devotional service. But if we still are trying to fulfill our material desires and practice Krishna consciousness and chant, well, that's that's one of the offenses in the, the holy name that's called the tenth offense that's the i and mind offense it's called i and mind that's an example if we think oh well you know i was born in india and we used to do all kinds of pujas and homas and sacrifices and worships yeah i can still do that and chant Hare krishna and it's all the same because worship is worship right no <laughs> the holy name is 
Krishna in transcendental sound. Kali Kale, Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar. Krishna is incarnated in the form of his holy name. It's non different than the Lord himself. These other processes are meant for elevation from a lower mode to a higher mode, but they're not transcendental. <laughs> like the holy name. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yeah, so just be aware of the offenses and avoid them. That's all. <laughs> it's good. Every day, read the offenses. If you read them every day, you'll start to understand. Srila Prabhupada, Harinam Chintamani especially, explains each of the offenses. Oh. And uh, Srila Prabhupada's Bhagavatam, especially the second candle, which we're discussing now the first chapter in the second canto verses 11 and 12 those two verses have a lot about the holy name and the offenses and how to avoid the offenses also hope that helped you Prabhu Mataji thank you thank you so much Maharaj Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Marge, there's a question in the chat that I would like to read. Hare Krishna devotees, I have a question for Guru Maharaj. When we chant and the mind wanders on other topics, how do we focus on the Harinam? Also, how do we build taste in chanting so it is not felt as a task to just complete rounds? It's nice to offer prayers prior to chanting. Pray to the spiritual master, Lord Chaitanya. Pray to the holy name itself. There are authorized prayers that one can pray. For instance, we chant the Shikshastakam prayers every day. That's also part of the morning program. We can chant those prayers. We can chant Namastakam by Srila Rupa Goswami. Those prayers also help us to solidify our consciousness where we can avoid uh, the the you know, the wanderings of the mind. Those two prayers, Namastika by Rupa Goswami, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Shikshastakam prayers. There's individual prayers that are mentioned in different places throughout the scriptures. There's some devotees who spend a half hour to, 20 minutes to a half hour just offering prayers prior to, before they start the japa. Like that. And uh, if you want, I can send you a series of prayers. There's also prayers to the beads. You know, prayers to your japa beads also. There's a whole set of prayers. So the scriptures are full of that prayers that helps us to build the proper consciousness and receive the mercy of the Lord in any aspect that we undertake in devotional service. We can also recite these prayers even while we're chanting, if we feel the need to also. And that's one way. And then practice practice the process of hearing very carefully. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, whenever and wherever the mind wanders due to its, uh, what is it? Flickering nature, what is the, it's unsteady and flickering nature. Bring it back under the control of the set. When your mind wanders to something else, bring it back. Bring it back to the sound of the holy name. It's called Japa meditation. <laughs> Not Japa cell phone meditation. <laughs> Shut that cell phone off <laughs> when you before you begin your japa every morning. Leave it off till you finish your rounds at least before breakfast. You're not missing anything. <laughs> yeah. Marge, I have a question. Um, I, I'm just reminded by a session that I attended by Nashringa Kavacha Prabhu on deity worship. 
And he was sharing a short clip by His Holiness Banu Swami on, on deity worship. And he was saying how, um, you know, one might think chanting is, is, is enough, but not hearing the Bhagavatam class or hearing the class, but not chanting or chanting, but not reading and all that or, or doing, doing deity worship. And he was mentioning that all this is so important for us to deepen our relationship with Krishna. And then he brought it to another level, Marge, where even the chanting is supposed to go deep within our hearts so that we also not just chant because we think, oh, if I just chant, I'll just go back to Godhead. But we don't have, uh, you know, we don't respect devotees. We don't have relationship with them. So how much Marge is chanting related to devotee relationship? Like, does it do the work? Or should we have that mindset? Well, there's five powerful forms of devotional service as mentioned by Rupa Goswami, which he received this knowledge directly from Lord Chaitanya. And that is chanting the holy names, hearing and reading Srimad Bhagavatam, worshiping the Lord's form as a deity, living in a holy place and associating with devotees. Lord Chaitanya emphasized two of these five, chanting the holy name and associating and serving Vaishnavas. Uh, if you don't associate and serve Vaishnavas, you, you're, it's very difficult to bring to the chanting of the holy name. Unless you were a pure devotee in your last life and you somehow came back just to finish up. But no one should assume that. <laughs> There are devotees who are more advanced. You can't say everyone, when they come into this movement, is on the same level of advancement. It's not possible. People have Krishna consciousness from previous lives, sometimes from many previous lives. So, But the process is generally applied to everyone like that. But there's others who move fast through the process and get, get right to chanting more and more and more because of their... Uh, what we say, their adhikari, their development of the whole process from previous lives. So, but still, the, the spiritual master and the Lord recommends we follow the process. But chant, but uh, associating with devotees is really the foundation by which we can develop the enthusiasm and the qualifications to chant more and more. Lord Chaitanya emphasized, uh, uh, what is it? Nam Ruchi, Vaishnav Seva, Jiva Doya. The Jiva Doya means preaching. These are the three things that Lord Chaitanya emphasized. Thank you, Marge. Actually, when, when you mentioned the two points, now I remember... Nashinga Kavacha talking about Nashinga Kavacha Prabhu talking about that in the in the workshop. Thank you for sharing that. He did go from five down to two points. Thank you, Marge. You know, yes. Association of devotees also helps to purify us from our anarthas. It's not it only gives us inspiration and opportunity for service, but it helps us to develop those qualities that are conducive, such as tolerance, patience, humility detachment, all of these things that are supported by Vaishnava Association. And Vaishnava Association is also a mirror that helps you to see what you don't need and what you could, what you can adopt also. If you're perceptive enough to be looking for these things, you know. You can't associate with devotees if you're not practicing humility and tolerance. These two things have to be practiced in the association of devotees. Otherwise, you can't stay in that association. Marge, it's so powerful and amazing that everything that we do in our Krishna consciousness, it boils down to the connection of devotee association. It's like without that, there's just no hope. 
Everything. Well, Bob made that statement, which we mention occasionally. He said there's three things important important in us in Krishna consciousness. He said association, association, association. He said these three things. <laughs> Even Krishna associates with others. <laughs> you never see pictures of Krishna alone. He's with the cows. He's with his friends. He's with the gopis. He's with his parents. He's, he's always with somebody. And Krishna likes to associate with others. <laughs> he doesn't have to, but he's he's also, he, that's a platform of enjoyment. Association of devotees brings happiness. <laughs> That's where you get your happiness from. Not sitting in your room in your meditative state, you know. That may be nice, but <laughs> when you share Krishna consciousness with others and you learn from others, this is where the one becomes happy. Because the whole process of life is relationships. Happiness is based on relationships. And our ultimate relationship is with Krishna. But we develop that relationship with Krishna through our association with devotees. <laughs> Which is also a form of happiness. Life means relationship. If you want to know what life's about, relationship. <laughs> the most miserable people who don't like to be with other people. They're miserable <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> and you, it's not like you have to have so many people around you, but we have to have relationships on some level with devotees where we can exchange Krishna consciousness together, so help each other, so, uh, inspire each other in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Learn from each other, all of that's there in the association. Marsh, powerful points, Marsh. I'm just typing my notes away. Thank you, Marsh. Nita Gopal, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Marsh. Uh, regarding relationship at the initial stage, we may not have the relate, direct relation with Krishna like how we show the Maya or the Arjun had it. So how do you go about strength, strengthening relation with Krishna in the initial stage, Maharaj? Well, it's all there by the process. The process is about, is about connecting with Krishna through, through devotional service. That strengthens your relationship. So do we have to think, uh, I have like parental or uh, the uh, friendship or the Madhuri, do we have to think in that direction or just serve and it will uh, come to that perfect stage automatically later on? Krishna is there in his deity. He's non-different than the deity. He's non-different than the holy name. He's non-different than Prashadam. Uh, the spiritual master represents Krishna in the material world. He is seen to be the servitor godhead there is servant god who is serving god who is serving god who is serving is the spiritual master all of these are manifestations of the absolute truth that you, you we connect with through the process of bhakti that's all okay. and as you intensify these processes and develop them more you can actually experience the presence of krishna in your heart, within your mind, and in your day-to-day -day activities. <laughs> and then when you become pure, and then you can see him directly. <laughs> He's there. So not necessarily we have to have the relation like the high, how you show the Maya, like the three stages, of, three, uh, like five stages of the uh, one's relation. We don't have to Nitya, Think in that direction. Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Kabunai Sravanari Siddhi Chitti Kori Adai. In the hearts of all living entities, pure love for God exists. Jibaya Surupai Krishna or Nitya Das, all living entities are eternally servants of the Lord. 
we have that relationship. You can't break it. But the coverings of the material energy kind of block that understanding of that relationship. And we can't experience it because we are still covered by the material energy. Cut through the coverings and the relationships is revealed more and more. That's bhakti. <laughs> So as one intensifies the bhakti, that relationship will automatically arose and will come. You, you're, you're always in contact with Krishna, but you can't experience it because you're covered. That's all. The more you uncover it, the more you experience it. It's there. <laughs> you can't be separated from Krishna. It's not possible. <laughs> but consciousness separates us from the experience of being with Krishna. It's just consciousness. Purify the consciousness, the relationship is, is experienced. Yeah. Krishna is there. He's always there. In fact, he's the closest thing to you. <laughs> that's, that's not a euphemism. He's in your heart. <laughs> he's there. When Hanuman was feeling separation from uh, from Sita and Ram, they said to Hanuman, 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 he, the Lord's in your heart. And he became so anxious, he grabbed his chest to tear it open just to see that the, whether the Lord was in his heart. And you can see that picture. It's a nice picture. Right. And the Lord's there in the heart. <laughs> You're never alone, even if you're in the midst of the, the deepest, darkest forest. Still, Krishna is there. And that thought itself is so solacing and uh, satisfying. The Lord is in the heart, feels so much uh, relief and uh, peacefulness by just having that thought in every time. Yeah. But pay attention to him. That's the whole thing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Keep your attention on Krishna. And then you'll experience his presence more and more. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Maharaj, as you were speaking, and I want to quickly say this before I get to Sri Devi. Maharaj, I remember a, 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 a sentence that you mentioned in your class last week, which is very, very powerful for, for me, where you said that no sacrifice, no love. It was last Tuesday, I believe, you said that love begins when we sacrifice. And you said, when we do not sacrifice, then there is, it's, you know, there is no love. And you're talking about devotional service and connecting that so that, that was a, a, a takeaway that I wanted to share um that you mentioned in class that was very powerful for me it was no sacrifice no love love begins when sacrifice begins right that's the word you got it yes like love begins when sacrifice begins the beginning of our sacrifice is to chant the holy names of the Lord mm -hmm. associate with devotees these are all forms of sacrifice to choose between what I want and what Krishna wants. <laughs> That's sacrifice. <clears throat> what's pleasing to the Lord first before what's pleasing to for me, right, Maharaj? Like what Krishna not, not necessarily. There's a there's a philosophy like that. Please yourself and Krishna is automatically please. Prabhupada shoots that mm -hmm. You have to find out what pleases the Lord by understanding the instructions given by the spiritual master and by Krishna himself through the scriptures. Thank you, Marj. There are three questions and I'm going to go to Sri Devi first. Thank you, Anasuya. Guru Maharaj, as you are speaking about the various stages of chanting and how the mind wanders so much and how difficult it is to bring the mind under control to really focus on the holy name, how can we continue to remain hopeful 
even though our chanting is not up to par. Well, the scriptures say if you just continue, you'll actually become successful. Prabhupada used to say, if the only way you can lose in this practice is you give up. It's the only way you can lose. If you never give up, then eventually you'll come to the platform of becoming more and more advanced in Krishna consciousness. For some it's fast, for some it's slow, for some it's very slow. But don't give up. <laughs> Keep trying. Stay within the process. <clears throat> it works. It's Radharani in the form of her mercy, which is called devotional service. She's Bhakti Devi. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Marge, I remember a Prichit watching a short video, uh, I mean, a lecture by Radhanath Swami. And there was a devotee that asked a question of, of to, to Radhanath Swami. And the same thing, Marge, you know, I've been chanting for, for, for so long and I'm still not getting the taste. I'm still not doing this. I'm still not getting attracted. And Radhanath Swami asked this devotee, how many years have you been chanting? And this devotee said, 15 years. And Marjas and Radha Swami's response was just one line, like two words, that three words. Keep on chanting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Minutes, nothing. How many lifetimes you've been in a material world? <laughs> That's the scary part, Marge. You need to know it's like scary. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. When Hayagriva was with Srila Prabhupada in 26 Second Ave in the first, when they, everything was just beginning, Hayagriva, he said, Srila Prabhupada, <laughs> I have been practicing for one year, but I don't have love of God. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, oh, one year. Hmm. How long have you been in the material world? <laughs> How many lifetimes? <laughs> koti, koti, koti. <laughs> so the process is fast or slow, depending on how enthusiastic you execute the process. For some, it's very slow. And for some, it's very fast. Your determination and your enthusiasm is the means by which you access the mercy and move fast through Prabhupada. Choose Krishna, don't choose Maya. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Rather, so, I keep saying rather. Rasavi Lasani Radha. I'm switching it up. I'm sorry, Mataji. Okay, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, while associating with devotees, familiarity is good or not, Maharaj? Because we do lots of mistakes mm -hmm. while associating with devotees. So that's the question, Maharaj. The question is? Familiarity with devotees, is that good or not? Because we associate with devotees so much that we tend to cross the familiarity boundary. So is that good or not? Well, uh, familiarity means to take things cheaply. If we take things, if we just take things cheaply, like it's okay, it's just ordinary. Then that's then that causes us to lose respect. Always keep respect for the devotees. We can be friendly. We have friendly relationships. Friendship is me re recommended to develop in Krishna consciousness. But friendship, still, the, the element of respect should always be there. And then we can be friendly. Sometimes we joke. Sometimes we even chide each other like that. But everything is done in a, in a spirit of friendship, not in this not in some mean spirit <laughs> or some spirit of annoyance. <laughs> Thank you, 
Ralph would could chastise, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that he didn't still have re regards for that person. So there's different moods that come up in our relationship, and sometimes things become familiar. If uh, one of the defects is becoming familiar with the spiritual master, mm -hmm. that could lead to think thinking the relationship is ordinary. Sometimes the spiritual master is very open and friendly. But we shouldn't take advantage of that and think that, you know, you know, I can just relax in that relationship. <laughs> it's not about that. Yeah. Now that's mentioned familiarity, hypocrisy, duplicity, uh, disobedience. Um, there's five flaws that the disciple can commit in relationship to the spiritual master. So familiarity is there. Sometimes, you know, even when we become familiar with our husband or wife, we sometimes take advantage of their, their, their position, and we minimize their importance. For a devotee, everybody is important because everybody's part and parcel of Krishna. <laughs> no matter what position they are, no matter what age group they are, everyone is special because they, they belong to Krishna, not to us. <laughs> so. We get friendly, we get familiar, we sometimes relax that relationship a little bit. But it's always in the mood of service, not in the mood of wanting to be served, not in the mood of, of uh, what we say, enmity or envy. None of these things fit into devotional relationships. Hope that helped. Mataji. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, there's a question in the chat, and I think this will be the we'll see. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm having a little trouble going up. Oh, this is Raj, uh Vishaka, Raja Gopi, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All Gosha Shura Prabhupada. Maharaj, I have a follow-up question about Oh, Krishna, I'm, I'm I'm not very savvy this morning, Maharaj. Relationship, um, relationship. You want to read it? Yeah, can you? Because I'm not able to go up and down. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories is here, Prabhupada. I have a follow-up question about relationships. Could you explain the significance of relationship with Krishna versus relationship with devotees? Which is more important? Often it seems quote unquote, easier or more comfortable to have what seems like a relationship with Krishna because there are less uncomfortable situations, vulnerability, sacrifice, as there are with devotees who are immediately in front of us or with us. Hmm. <laughs> That's the question. There are people who give up Krishna consciousness because they weren't able to properly associate with devotees or take advantage of that association. Krishna mentions in the uh, in the Adi Purana, he who says he's my devotee is not my devotee, but he who says he's a devotee of my devotee is actually my devotee. That's spoken by Krishna himself. So some people say, well, that's for the pure devotee. But Prabhupada clarifies that. He said, das, das, anu, das. And he says a hundred times we move. We should learn to become the servant of each and every devotee. Devotees' association with other devotees is in the mood of serving, not in the mood of enjoyment. Enjoyment may also be there through the process of service. But service is the focus by which relationships develop and become really wonderful. So, yeah, it starts with devotee. You really can't have a re real relationship with Krishna. It won't develop 
beyond a certain point unless you actually develop relationships with those who are dear to Krishna. When you serve those who are dear to Krishna, then Krishna is very much pleased. And who's who's not dear to Krishna? Everybody's dear to Krishna, but some are more dear. <laughs> Sometimes we think, well, I'll serve only in this way, but I won't serve in that way. There are people who are like that. And they say, well, my service is to serve in this way. That's nice. And it's service and that's good. But sometimes there is a situation where you have to uh, in order to help a person who is in need or something comes up as an emergency, one has to accept, you know, sometimes the toilets have to be cleaned. <laughs> sometimes you have to go and deliver some medicine to some devotee who needs medicine. <laughs> you know, the mood of service doesn't exempt certain types of service. Of course, we don't try to uh, present ourselves as being great servants just by doing everything, just to show, yeah, I'm everybody's servant. That's another expansion of false ego. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a fine line, the mood of service. Why am I serving? I'm serving to please, I'm not serving to get something. I'm serving to be somebody, to gain something from my service. Service for the sake of service. And that's how it works with devotees. Okay, so um, I do have a little bit of a tighter schedule than normal today. So uh, sorry, Maharaj. We took so much of your time because this is an amazing, interesting point. Um, Marge, I, I, I know you've mentioned this in the past, and I, I think the next time you come, I think we'll definitely have to arrange for a workshop on the holy name, Maharaj. At least come and purify Iskon Harrisburg, if you can start there. You're having your Rathiatra soon, right? I was just reading about it in the, uh, and the ISKCON news. Yes, Marge. It is next Saturday, a week from this Saturday on July 20th. So it's, it's a great like, opportunity to spread Krishna consciousness. Yes. Absolutely, Maharaj. And we really hope that uh, next day I'll get a better date. And if you could come and give us a workshop, Marge, I, I, I think every one of us need that. Speaking for myself, we have to... And as the verse said, you know, the only way right now is the holy name. We just got to work on that. And Marge, I do like this point that you said was, uh, you know, serving to please, sorry, serving to please and not serving to get something. Well, I, that's I think... service. If you're serving to get something, it's not service, it's business. Mm -hmm. That's business. I give something and I... And you give me something back, or I get something for giving something. Service means for the benefit of the object that you're serving. That's all. And when you do it with love, then that's pure, then that's that's bhakti. <laughs> Radharani, she knows she would like to be with Krishna, but she knows Krishna likes to be with other gopis. So sometimes she goes to the other gopis and she spends time with them explaining how best to serve Krishna because she wants that other gopi to serve Krishna very nicely, which pleases Krishna. So she'll sacrifice being with Krishna in order to give Krishna pleasure because he wants to be with another gopi. Marge, again, that word sacrifice, you know, mm -hmm. that's with this love. Amazing. That's what bhakti is about. <laughs> yes, Marge. It's about, loving it's about loving Krishna and loving Krishna's devotees also. Yeah. Love Keep... means 
Service, love means to serve, love means to cooperate, to serve together. What's love? <laughs> Reminds me of Sri Prophet. You can show your love for me by co by cooperating with one another with one another. Mm -hmm. That's what Prophet said. Amazing. She actually, she actually had a question, but Yes, Maharaj. I was yeah, she took it down as soon as you said that you had to leave. So can she ask Maharaj? You can't say no to Shakshi. There you go, Sakshi. Go ahead. Roll. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question related to devotees association. Uh, so for those who don't get often association of advanced devotees, like uh, on the level of Madhyam or Uttam Adhikari, so uh, is it okay for them to keep on associating with uh, Kanisht Adhikari or uh, the new devotees, like no, you should seek out that that high that that higher association. You should make plans to go for that association, even if you have to travel to get it. That's fundamentally to your spiritual advancement. Okay, Mara. At least money from the association. Utama, you may not always find Utama available, but but at least money from the association. That you have to be proactive for. We travel to go to festivals, to associate with other devotees. We do that. That was a very nice question, Sakshi. Very nice. One thing I noticed, today's class had oh, 42 people on it. Marge, I was about to end with that, that we had, uh, you know, the mark. We hit the mark, Marge. We, you know, we had 42. You're right. Yeah. This Amazing. Is, this is the best I've seen Harrisburg come through, you know. <laughs> Marge, that is the reason why I was asking next day if you could come and purify us with a weekend workshop of the Holy Name, Marge, because I need help with that, Marge. <laughs> the more you, Marge, you come, the more numbers will be. Uh, I don't, I can't hear what you're saying, but that's okay. I don't really need to. <laughs> well, what I said is the more you come, the more numbers will be. No, Maharaj heard you. He's not listening. He doesn't want to hear it is what it is. <laughs> Maharaj heard what you said. He's just closing his ears. <laughs> well, I hear it, but I don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> but... I should keep saying it, Maharaj, that's. You'll have a wonderful Rathi Yatra and you'll see. I won't be there and it'll be like, you know, it'll be the spiritual world. I remember your presence last year, Maharaj. Yeah, that was nice. This one looks better this year. At least from what I read so far and heard so far, and it looks like it's going to be great. Hey, Krishna Maharaj, please accept my whole obeisance as all glory to the power part. This isn't for me, but it's, it looks like there's uh, Bhaktim Bani left something in the chat. Can you, I'm sure, can you still read or what do you want to do? She's still online. I can see her name, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Sorry, she... I was muted. The philosophy of being oneself and assuming Krishna is pleased is sometimes referred to as Satanism. Anton Levy says in the Satanic Bible, do unto others as they do to you, which is the opposite of Christianity and Krishna consciousness. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> we don't really quote Satanic Bibles. <laughs> Maharaj, before we end, I know you said that you had a tight schedule. Do, do, are you able to chant around or would that be pushing it for you, Maharaj? Um, I do have rounds to do, but what time is it now? It's, it's 9, almost 9.30. 9 9.30, yeah. Everything is super, super tight. Maharaj, yeah, I'm not going to push you. It's I'm fine. That's it up because I'm on, the, I'm on the road today soon. Oh, that's right. You're flying. That's right. That's right. You're flying on. 
Thank you so much, Marge, for such a wonderful class. We thank the devotees for joining us, and we all hope that, you know, a takeaway or two or three or four as we meditate on the holy name, how we can improve it on ourselves. And we thank Marge for giving us so much of his time.